Hi, everybody. Is anybody missing a bag that's laying on the stage? I just want to make sure. It's a quilted, lovely bag that's going to be mine if you don't claim it before the end of the service. Just saying. I'm kidding. We'll turn it into Lost and Found. My name is Susan. I'm going to be your hostess tonight. Welcome. Make sure I'm standing in the right spot. Welcome, everybody, online. Did everybody get their weather alert on their phone that there is fog outside? I love when you get an alert for something you already know. Will you guys bow your heads? I have some prayers and some praises. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us all here tonight through the fog. There's been plenty of it, internally and externally. As we get ready to prepare to worship and praise your name, God, we just ask for big, deep breaths, everybody to settle into their chairs for just a second, because we're going to get up and worship. For everybody to leave anything that is weighing heavily on their hearts and their minds at the door, knowing that you've already got it figured out and you are in control, so there's no point in us trying to figure it out. Lord, we just ask for you to give an extra tight hug to those that are hurting and those that are in need and those that are questioning. Let them feel your presence. We praise you, God, for the miracles that you've already created today and the prayers that you've answered today and those that are coming, because there always are more miracles and more answered prayers. We love you, Lord. We just want to honor you. We want to praise you. We want our hands and feet to be yours and our words to be yours. And we want to glorify you in all that we do. And we came tonight and we're online tonight to rest in your presence, to hear you speak to us, and to learn how to be obedient and follow you. Thanks for never giving up on us. In Jesus' name, amen.
My cheeks are hurting from smiling because you guys have no idea what this sounds like. And I know that God is so excited right now. Yeah. Yeah. Praising the name of God. He can't miss it because it's so loud and it's so passionate and the Holy Spirit is moving. And that's so incredibly cool. So with that said, will you guys pray with me for the offering? Heavenly Father, woo, we are praising you. And I hope you heard every single voice just lifting up our love and our praise for you and our thanks for you. And we know that everything that we have is because of you and the sacrifice that Jesus made. Lord, as we pray over these tithes and these offerings, Lord, we just ask for you to use them to grow your kingdom, to help others. Let our resources that you've given us be stewarded in a way that will benefit and bless others, that will show who Jesus is, who you are, and how much you love each and every one of them. Lord, we pray for generous hearts. We pray for always remembering to be a good steward of the resources and blessings that you've given us. And we just thank you for the never-ending blessings and faithfulness that you bestow on us every minute of every day. In Jesus' name, amen. I did want to remain remind remind you guys, um, since we are talking about praising, if you want to pray and, and you want to pray by yourself, come on this side. If you want somebody to pray over you, we do have prayer partners that'd be happy to pray over you. Just come on this side, which is my right. There are uh, bowls in the front and in the back. And then mychristchurch.com slash give. I have to work on that one um, if you want to give online. So thank you and amen.
I don't know about you guys, but there's no place I'd rather be than right here. So let's get into God's word. Colossians 3.11. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters, and he lives in all of us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Turn to your neighbor and say, hey. God is good all the time. time. Welcome to everybody joining us online. Welcome to our CM campus. I had something happen during the worship time that I don't think has ever happened to me before. Uh, But I'm going to go on the side of going with the ping. I'm just at a point in my life where that's going to happen. I don't know. I don't know what I saw something just sort of kind of in my spirit, and I'm just going to explain it to you because I believe it's for some bodies, not just somebody. I just saw this huge storm cloud, a, a storm bank, and, and it was all that was there, and, and it, it was an ominous storm bank, and, and it just felt like it couldn't be penetrated. And then as people prayed, I began just to see some things moving, and then there was just a single pinhole of light that came through and then that light just burned away all of that storm back that's what I got and I'm going to share it with you I want to add a little prophecy to that I want to prophesy that if that's for you that that light not only will burn away that storm back but it'll swallow it whole and the light will consume that darkness that is all over in your life right now so if that's for you great If it wasn't, that's 30 seconds you'll never get back in your life. Were you asked to describe yourself in a minute or less? How might you go about the task? How would you describe yourself? Would you tell people about your ancestry, your marriage, your family? Would you tell them about your connections or your friendships or your vocation? Would you tell them about your interests or your brand of politics or your social economic status? Would you point out your accomplishments, offer your resume? Would you express your dreams? I don't know how you would deal with that, but I can tell you for Paul, the whole identity of the Christian is found in Christ and Christ alone. So for Paul, in his letter to the Colossians, the answer to that would be, I am Christ. I am Christ. I, my identity is rooted in Christ. In fact, part of what makes us Christian is an identity that is solely rooted in the work of Christ. This identity is based upon the fact that we are all straight up sinners. Can I hear an amen from somebody? We are all loved by God. Can I hear an amen from somebody? We are saved only by grace. Can I hear an amen from somebody? And that grace is shown to us through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We call that Orthodox Christianity. That's what we believe. We are Christ's special possession. And he is ours. I remember singing a song when I was a kid. It was my, one of my least favorite songs we used to sing. But... As I get older, I I get it. He said, I am my beloved's, and he is mine. His banner over me is love. It's about an identity rooted in God is mine, and I am God's. And and that covers me. That is my covering. This is who we are. It's all we are. It's all we need. In the previous verses, we were instructed to strip off the old identity and live into a new identity in Christ. And it's akin to taking off an old tattered piece of clothing for the purpose of putting on a brand new one. The process by which God accomplishes this in our life, shedding of the old, putting on the new, is called holiness. 
Holiness refers to a people set apart. Holy people are different. And the more we grow in holiness, the more different we become. The antonym of holy in the biblical sense is not profane. It's ordinary. We base our identity upon being extraordinarily God's. We're the opposite of ordinary. We are extraordinarily God's. On this next section of trail, we're going to further lean into that theological task of holiness. We're going to discover yet another exclusive claim about Jesus, and we're going to delineate some of the major themes from Colossians so far. So what I want to do is begin with some suppositions that are rooted in both Judaism and Christianity as they have to do with holiness. First of all, God is holy. God, that's who God is. God is set apart. God is holy. Number two, holiness is to be set apart for God. So if we are going to grow in holiness, we are increasingly set apart for God. Number three, holiness is to take on the nature of Christ. As we grow in this relationship, we become less and less like us and more and more like Jesus. Number four, holiness requires our consent. We must allow God to do God's work in our life. We must allow Christ to do Christ's work in our life. We must allow the Holy Spirit to do the work of the Spirit in our life. A very good prayer is, dear God, I give you consent to do anything in my life that you deem necessary. That's a good prayer. Number five, holiness is a constant process. It's a constant process. It's something that's always happening, always churning in us. Every time we encounter the word, those of you reading the New Testament with us this year, we're in the end of Matthew, and every time I hear those familiar words, it's a process. I'm encountering the word. The word stays the same, but I always encounter it from a different place in my own life. The word is the constant. I'm the variable. But because I'm the variable, I see these nuances in new light. It's a constant process. Number six, holiness is the life God created us to live. I saw a bumper sticker once. It said, Jesus is coming, look busy. And I, I thought about, when I was a young Christian, I think that probably represented a good hunk of my theology. I mean, you wouldn't want Jesus to show up and you'd be a slackered or something, right? But as I, as I get older, as I grow in my faith, I, I'm beginning to see that the life God created for me is holiness. It's, it's a life that is to be set apart for God. It's the ping life. It's a life of hearing God, heeding God, going with where God is. But this is the life God created us to live, a life of holiness. And then number seven, and this was my favorite part, the process is the destination. The process is the destination. A lot of times we think, oh, I'm an immature Christian, but I'm gonna be a mature Christian someday. Possibly. But... The idea is to be on the journey, to be on the soul track, to walk with Christ, to encounter Christ, to allow Christ to do Christ's work in our life. The, the process is the destination. There's this piece of me as I get older that thinks how far along we are may not be as important as which direction we're headed. When I was in high school, I had a friend who lived in the rural deeps. I mean the deeps. I had no idea how to get to his house, and I went there often. And you'd have to know me for that to make sense. <laughs> Generally speaking, you, you drove to the middle of nowhere, you crossed a bridge, and took a left. And one day, I was driving to his farm, and I took a wrong road and got hopelessly lost. I ended up somewhere near Sessor, Illinois. This was long before map apps long before Siri uh, I was just lost you say well didn't you have a map you sort of got to know where you are to have a map and no I didn't have a map I was just lost so as I drove this oiled country road I came upon a man sitting in a lawn chair in between his house and the road as, as people used to do in the summer 
because people didn't really have air conditioning and they would sit outside. It was the deeps of summer. This guy had a plug of tobacco in his mouth and he had a 22 rifle and he was sitting in a lawn chair. And I knew what he was doing. He was mole hunting. He was mole hunting. He was waiting for mole and drinking out of a mason jar and if he was going to shoot it. He'd been hunting for months. <laughs> he was dressed in overalls, uh, ventilated overalls. <laughs> no undergarments, lots of things unbuttoned, just enough to make you want to have a little bit of vomit in the back of your mouth. <laughs> he had on a railroad cap. You guys remember those old railroad caps? He's dressed in a pair of boots from World War I. So I pulled up and asked him where the Doubts Farm was. I said, do you know where the Doubts Farm is? And he nodded in the affirmative, shot out a stream of tobacco juice, wiped his mouth. He said, well, you need to turn around and drive north till you hit the intersection where the old Johnson place used to be. Now nah, that road's closed. You need to go straight for about five miles and turn east after the S curve. No. Nah, that bridge is out. After concocting about three more wild geographical scenarios, he looked at me, half grinned, and said, Son, I don't think you can get there from here. Oh. <laughs> he rearranged his wad of red man, shot out a stream, and belly laughed. And you could see a lot of his belly. <laughs> I was had. I just got in my car and drove on. Sometimes when we think about our highly flawed and whacked out selves, having an identity that is completely anchored in Christ, we might rightly suspect that we can't get there from here. Right? You ever look at a really good Christian and, and you think, I don't think I can get there from here. I don't, I don't think I could ever be that, knowing what I am. In our own power, we would be correct. We, we can't. But I need to tell you that in the power of the Holy Spirit, we most certainly can. Even if we need some directions, and even if we need some patience with ourselves, and even if it takes a while. You see, it's not enough to simply be a Christian. We are called to be Christian, increasingly Christ-like. So let me get to claim number 15. Jesus gives us a new identity. He gives us a new identity. That's what he gives to us. Verse 11, in this new life, not the old life, the new life, it doesn't matter if you are Jew or Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free, Christ is all that matters and he lives in all of us. Do you understand that these were the things that separated people? These were the barriers that separated people. This is what determined the us's and the them's. And he says, none of that matters. Because we have an identity that is in Christ, and he lives in all of us. Americans are divided. We're divided by our sensibilities, our cultures, our politics. We're divided by race and sexuality and where we stand on social issues educational level, socioeconomic status, the list goes on and on and on and on. The early church was anything but homogeneous. Anything. It consisted of Jews and Gentiles, men and women, slave and free. All the things that divide people today were in play for them as well. There's this idea that they used to have it easier than we do. False false their only hope for a witness of a united church was to embrace a shared identity in Christ and our only hope for a witness as a unified church is that each and every one of us embrace a shared identity in Jesus Christ it's our only hope you see if I see myself as this or that in some way, in my mind, I'm somehow going to be an us, and that would make you a them. Except to you, you're an us, and that would make me a them. And we're never going to have unity with us as in them. But if Christ lives in us, and our identity is based in Christ, we are all us's. All of us. 
When I first became a Christian, my social circle changed dramatically in the first year. It incrementally shifted from Christian, from non-Christian to Christian. I, I went from being the only Christian in my circle to a Christian circle. Slowly, I discovered that the Jesus I shared in common with my new believing friends gave us more in common than the affinities I shared with my non-believing friends. You say, well, what did you do? Did you just quit all your friends? No, they really sort of quit me. Yeah, it sort of went that way. I, I really didn't have to part ways with that crowd. Because you'll see that when a crowd is based on sin, when you no longer are interested in sinning, they have no more interest in you. You may think you're really important if your crowd is based on sin. You, my friend, are a standardized and interchangeable part. They just want somebody to sit at the bar next to them. And it doesn't really matter who it is. In Christ, we have a new identity. Colossians reminds us the telltale sign of a church that's right with God is unity in Jesus. When people with nothing in common but Jesus truly become brothers and sisters in the faith, we offer the world a credible witness. We offer empirical evidence that Jesus is in the house. When people are unified in Christ that no one would think would possibly be unified, we offer a powerful witness to Christ. During this reign of fire series on Colossians, we, we've had six themes emerge. I, I want to lean into these because I think it's so important that we get a bearing onto where we were, are. So I, I actually had seven, so we're, we're going to add one. So here we go. Seven ring of fire themes. Number one, the Bible is an accurate testimony to the intentions of God. The first thing I'm going to tell you is we need to make up our minds on the Bible. I believe the Bible. I believe if me and the Bible disagree, I am in error. I believe the Bible is not for me to change. I believe the Bible was given to change me. So Christians accept the Bible as God's word, period. We believe that what was written to the church at Colossae two millennia ago equally applies to us today. We believe that is relevant today. It is living. Number two, Jesus is one with God. The Trinity refers to one God who exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So Jesus is one with God. He's one in the Godhead. Number three, Jesus is the head of the church. If Jesus isn't in charge, it's not a church. There are a lot of really bad things happening around the world in the name of church. But you get looking at those, Jesus isn't in charge of those. Somebody is, but it's not Jesus. I've often pondered what makes a gathering of people a worship service. Isn't that fair? It's certainly not a bulletin, right? What makes a gathering of people a worship service? And, and I've concluded there's two primary things. The presence of the Holy Spirit and the headship of Christ. We gather underneath the covering, the head of Christ, and it's the presence of the Holy Spirit that transforms an assembly into a worship service. You got no Holy Ghost, you got no church. If Jesus is not the head, you have no church. Those things have to be there. You see, the United Methodists used to own our buildings, but they never owned our church. Now, we own our buildings. But we don't own our church. The church is the property of Christ and Christ alone. And the church isn't that brick. The church is you and me. This just gives us a house where most days we're kept safe except when pipes explode. <laughs> Number four, we are united with one another in Christ. The Christians are a sticky lot. The Jesus that is in us longs to connect with the Jesus that is in others. That's why I think it's so important that you get here early, you stay late, come for supper, get a cup of coffee, get a Danish, invite somebody to, to meet you here a little early next week. It's why we have a coffee cafe. I'm going to talk about that Sunday. 
But did you know when it comes to fellowship, the characteristics of the early church, one of the four features of that early church is fellowship. And then in the eight characteristics that it lists after that, you have to work really hard not to make fellowship two of the eight. It is that prevalent. Fellowship is absolutely essential to Christian community. Christian community is not an individual sport. Salvation is is individual, but we live that out with each other. We are united with one another in Christ. Number five, what we believe about Jesus matters. I've often heard it said it doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you believe it sincerely. That, of course, is stupid. (laughs) I've heard it said that Jesus is a way to God among other ways. That, of course, is not Christianity. That's just not Christianity. I've heard it said that whether or not we believe in a virgin birth or actual miracles, a literal resurrection or a second coming isn't all that important. And I would counter it's essentially important. Absolutely important. Paul reminds us that what we believe about Jesus isn't just important. It's really the only thing that bears eternal importance. There's a lot of things in life you can get wrong. You don't want to get Jesus wrong. There's internal implications there. Number six, what we truly believe impacts the way we live. If what we believe doesn't change how we think and what we do, we don't believe it strongly enough. If we believe in Christ, we will inevitably grow into the character of Christ. Bible-believing Christians believe that our best Lives are lived within the clear boundaries that God has set for us. To move beyond those clear boundaries is not to embrace freedom, it's to enter chaos. My belief in the Bible impacts the way I live. It impacts the way I think. I believe that we can be loving people and still say that this exists within the boundaries that God has set for us. Because I believe the Bible. So what we truly believe must impact the way we live. And then number seven, Jesus is just all we need. There'll always be the Jesus and crowd out there. You know, yeah, Jesus is all you need, but I gotta tell you, Paul's clear. Jesus is all we need. He's all we need for salvation. He's all we need for forgiveness. You know, I I wanna tell you, we've got a renovation thing coming up we did a capital campaign for that at the end of the year i'm really glad that so many people participated i'm I'm truly happy about that and and if god pinged you and that was a response that that's wonderful and all that but i gotta tell you we don't need that to be made right with god all we need is jesus I, i tell people all the time there's you are loved by god there's nothing you could do that would make god love you any less and there's nothing you could do to make God love you anymore. A lot of times we are so performance-based in how we think. When we're performing well, we think God really, really loves us. And when we're performing poorly, we think God doesn't love us. My classic joke is you could give a million dollars to the renovation campaign, and God won't love you anymore. I will. <laughs> but God won't. So let's wrap up by looking at some aspects of the character of Jesus that should be readily apparent in the lives of his followers. This is the part of Jesus that people should be able to see in us. For the past couple of weeks, I've used the metaphor of throwing a football. You can go over technique all you want. You can watch endless videos. You can take 100 written tests, but you really now don't know how you're doing throwing a football until you actually throw the football. And then you don't really have to have a mathematic equation. All you gotta do is watch. If you throw the football and it spirals perfectly and goes exactly where you want, you have done something right. If you throw the football, it looks like a wounded duck or a Phil Necro knuckleball and you're throwing it out there and it goes nowhere near it, you're doing something wrong. If you throw a poor football and you sit there and argue, but I did everything right, everybody knows that's ridiculous. Clearly you didn't do everything right got to throw the football it demonstrates what is actually happening in the process 
Paul has stated this reality in theological terms. And last week we looked at three sure signs of a poorly thrown football. Three sure signs that if these things are in you, and if you're fighting these all the time, these are three sure signs that things aren't where they need to be. Let's just review those real quick. Number one, inappropriate application of human sexuality. If sex controls you, there's something wrong. Sex is a gift from God to be expressed within clear boundaries, but it is not a God. Number two, inappropriate application of human needs. If material things control you, then something is wrong. We all need certain things, but when those needs our desires eclipse our desire and need for God, then those things have become idols. And then number three, inappropriate application of human emotion. If raw emotion controls you, there's something wrong. We are made to emotionally feel, but our emotions are to be brought under the lordship of Jesus Christ. So what I want to share with you, it is only by bringing ourselves into total submission under the lordship of Jesus Christ that we truly enter the process of holiness. And when we see these things flaring up, you don't need to get in condemnation. I told you last week, Melissa drives a truck that's, uh, I don't know, maybe got 188, 190,000 on it, and, and the check engine light come on, came on. You know, she doesn't need to feel bad about that. Oh, what did I do wrong? The check engine light's on. She didn't do anything wrong. But on the other hand, she can't really ignore it. In fact, we're dropping it off at the, at the mechanics tonight after church. We're dropping her truck off because you can't really ignore that check engine light. There's no reason for condemnation. You just need to get it fixed. So if this stuff's going on in your life, you don't need to be chewed up. Oh, I'm just terrible. I'm a terrible person. Oh, get over yourself. Just repent of this crap. Get your heart right with God and get her going. Get this stuff fixed. Get it fixed. Give it to Jesus. Paul is clear that anything that controls us other than Jesus is an idol. And the lust for idolatrous things is a sin. So now let's begin to lean into what happens when we get it right. We'll spend the next uh, couple, three weeks on this. So what happens when you get it right? What happens when you throw the ball? How do you know that it's spiraling? How do you know that you're on target? This is great stuff. And this is more encouraging than the other stuff, right? Yeah, it just is. Remember, sometimes God loves on us. Sometimes God shoves on us. I like to love it. Whoa, 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 right, right. All right, so... Verse 12, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, how do you like that? It's feeling good, isn't it? You know, a lot of times, you know, we get feeling pretty bad about things. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. We have a list. Houston, we have a list. There's nothing that makes me happier than a list. I love lists. I love checking things off of lists. I feel accomplishments. Sometimes I make a list just so I can check things off, even if I'm doing nothing because I feel so good about checking things off of lists. So let's take a look at this. When I was a freshman in high school, five of us got assigned to a PE class that was comprised of all seniors. I don't know how this happened, but I quickly ruled out good luck. In those days, they publicly picked teams to prepare you for disappointment later in life. And on this particular day, they were getting ready to enter the section on, in PE on basketball. So of course, two senior captains from the varsity basketball team were appropriately chosen to be the captains. And then all the rest of us had to stand there and get picked. Does anybody remember these days? Yeah, we just stood there and got picked. When a person was chosen, they lined up behind the team captain, which meant the pool got smaller and smaller and smaller. Yeah. When the other senior basketball players were there, they, they all got picked first, and then all the other senior athletes. And then the seniors who had some possible athletic ability, and then all the seniors who had no 
athletic ability. And every single time, there were five of us left, five freshmen. Do you remember how small you are when you're a freshman compared to seniors? There we stood. And they would argue over who had to take us out loud. I remember once this guy goes, take Bishop. And the guy goes, we don't want him. Yeah, I barely even remember it. <laughs> Terrible. Terrible. So are you ready for some good news? We all can relate to that, right? You ready for some good news? Because I got some. God picked you to be on his team. He picked you. He picked you. He didn't have to sit and argue with the devil over who had to take you. He picked you. He doesn't look at you and think, terrible. He wanted you on his team. You are God's first pick. And so you're saying, how do you know? Because the Bible tells me so. You see, if God weren't reaching out to you, you wouldn't be reaching out to God. If God didn't want you in church tonight, you wouldn't be in church tonight. If God were not pinging you, you wouldn't be pinging. The fact you are here means that God is reaching out to you. Salvation comes at the initiative of God. We don't choose God. God chooses us. You've been chosen. He picked you. Out of everybody, he picked you. But it's one thing to get picked, and it's quite another to have to play the game, right? You know, just because you get picked first doesn't mean you're any good. We, uh, at family events, we, we, we choose up teams, and we, we do it kind of quietly. But uh, we just try to make the teams even. And, and it's always so funny, because the younger that the grandkids are, the more poorly they pick in terms of Athleticism. So we, if we're playing a football game, you know, and we've got the whole family there, if one of the, the younger ones would pick, they'd, they'd pick the person they like the best, who almost was never a good football player. <laughs> and then the older ones would always just pick the good football players, regardless of who they liked. Well, here is the deal. Just because you got picked first doesn't mean you know how to play football. Just because God picked you doesn't, know you know, doesn't mean you know how to be a Christian yet we got to learn that just because you made the volleyball team doesn't mean that you're a great volleyball player you're going to have to learn that just because you made the basketball team just because you made the band doesn't mean you can play a trumpet very well yet we're going to have to learn that so we're on the team we were picked on the team but folks we still have some work to do say that with me we still have some work to do that's what this is all about when i was growing up there was no such thing as organized football until our freshman year in high school we had tryouts in the late summer i don't remember much about it, I just remember they put the names of everybody that made the team, and I remember my name was on there. And then I remember the day that we all received our equipment for the very first time. It wasn't like baseball, where they gave you a jersey, a hat, and some pants, and said, good luck, kid. Uh, on that particular day, we, we got a helmet, a massive pair of shoulder pads, a mesh practice jersey, two game jerseys, a mouthpiece, football pants, socks, shoes, a belt, something called a girdle, and then this group of unassorted pads, big and small. I had no idea what to do with it. It looked like a 500-piece jigsaw puzzle. And I could see the picture on the box. I just had no idea how to assemble the puzzle. And then they gave us this military-style duffel bag to, to shove it all in. And then they gave us a locker and a padlock. I had no idea what to do with any of it. None. So we spent that practice learning to properly assemble and wear our football uniform. Oh, the big stuff's easy. You know a helmet goes on your head. But boy, finding the right slots for all those pads in that girdle thing, learning the process to make our mouthpieces fit, which involve boiling water at home, uh, learning in what order to start dressing. It, it just took a while to get it all down. And then I had no idea how all this stuff was going to fit in my locker. And I had no idea how to work a combination lock. None. Well, they taught us how to hang our equipment after practice so it didn't get moldy. It smelled, 
It was in a drying room and it smelled like the backside of a yak all summer. I mean, it's the most horrible smelling thing. They, they told us how to clean it. They, they told us when to take it home to be washed. So now I had all the gear. I had all, more information I could possibly assimilate. And, and it's just going to take a while to get it down. Sometimes, as Christians, we, we've made the team. We've accepted Jesus into our hearts. We've responded. We've, the gifts of the Holy Spirit have been downloaded. You know, I mean, we've got those things available to us. We just don't know how to use them yet. We don't know how to put on the whole armor of God yet. We just got a bunch of stuff out in front of us, and we're not sure how, how to go about all of that. Well, in a very real sense, God gives us the gear, which are spiritual gifts. He gives us the playbook, which is the Bible. He gives us everything we need to live victorious Christian lives. But you just got to understand, it's going to take a while to properly use it, to properly utilize it. It's going to take a while to get it all down. And that's where you got to be patient with yourself. That's where you got to be patient with others. Just patient with others. But once we get it all down, and we will, something incredible happens. We are transformed. I remember taking all my football stuff home. And uh, one of the greatest days, if you, if you grew up in athletics, one of the greatest days was when you first got your uniform. Remember when I was seven, I got my first baseball uniform, Murphy Wall State Bank, Pinckney Bell, Illinois. It was made of wool, weighed about 30 pounds. And then when, he, when you sweated through it in the summer, it weighed about 90 pounds. It was horrible, itched, terrible. I slept in it for weeks. I mean, it was, it was the greatest thing ever. And when God gives us this, this uniform, this salvation, these gifts of the Holy Spirit, we are transformed and we are transforming. I remember taking all my football stuff home and carefully laying it out on my bed. And then I remember trying to remember everything and putting it all on in my bedroom. It took a while. But I remember when I was all dressed, I, I got done and I popped that helmet on. And I looked into the mirror. And I still remember how I felt because I didn't see Shane in a football uniform. I saw a football player. I saw a football player. I was no longer a scrawny kid out for football. I was a football player. I was a Ducoin Indian. I had a tribe. I had teammates. I had a new identity. I had a new identity. We are made into Christians the moment we receive Christ as our Savior. But the process of being shaped into the image of Christ is only just beginning. None of us knew anything about organized football when we made that football team. None of us knew anything about organized football. We played sandlot football all the time. We knew nothing about organized football. That first practice wasn't the end of a thing. It was the beginning of a thing. It takes time to understand how to recognize, assemble, and fully utilize all this new equipment that God has given us. It takes time to get to know this Christ who saved us, and it takes even more time to be shaped into his image. It takes time to transform from an ordinary person into a football player, and it takes time to transform from an ordinary new Christian into a a Christian embracing a life of holiness. But tonight, I just want to tell you, you can get there from here. You say, you don't know what I've done. I don't care what you've done. Jesus died on a cross to pay the price for your sins in your past. They have no bearing now. None. No bearing at all. You can get there from here. You can. There will be a day, and I can't tell you when, but there will be a day when you are asked to describe yourself. And perhaps to your surprise, you respond in a way you never imagined. I am 
Christ. And Christ is mine. And that will be the best day ever. Wow, is anyone else really encouraged? What a great sermon. <sighs> okay, I feel all invigorated and calm and full of Jesus right now. So let's all pray. Wow, Lord, you know how to deliver. That is absolutely true. Um, thank you for that incredible sermon. And I'm not sportsy, Lord, but thank you for the analogies that I get and how you tie that all together, that we are chosen by you, that we were picked for the team, and that we don't have to know how to play the game, but that we have to do something, that we have to take the manual that you've given us, read it, study it, practice it. That's something new in a Bible study I'm learning, practicing. It takes practice to be a Christian. Thank you for teaching us that so that we can tell the enemy to get lost when he tries to institute his gift of condemnation, which happens to all of us. But Lord, we also are so grateful just to know that there's a plan and we just need to follow the plan. Each one of us is in our own walk and you know that and you knew that in advance and you knew that when you chose us and we just ask that you guide us. We open up our hearts and give you consent to change anything that you think needs to be changed. And we just want to continue to have a life of singing your praises and walking in, in Jesus' steps. So we just continue to thank you for loving us and for choosing us for the team. And Lord, um, we just lift up all of our love and praise to you as we continue to walk in this walk. And we know that you're walking right beside us. Please let everybody be safe going home through the fog. And thank you for just another incredible night of worship and fellowship. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Go in peace.